Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESCCP. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to improve natural resource management with unmanned aircraft systems or UAS technology. First, Dr. Susan Cohen from the Institute for the Environment at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill will discuss the development of an operational framework for integrating UAS into the management of natural resources at a U.S. Marine Corps installation. Susan's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. And then Mr. David Delaney from the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center uh, the Construction Engineering Research Lab, will talk about a novel and cost-effective UAS technology that automates the process of collecting data from ground-based sensors. David's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a joint uh, longer uh, question and answer period um, featuring both Susan and David. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you are unable to download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible email, uh, a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you continue to have difficulties of your screen freezes, try keying in control and F5 to perform a hard refresh um, of your browser. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the join audio button, select test speaker and microphone and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have difficulties, call into the conference line shown here you can also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. Note that you can also download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Another option to follow along is um, through the CERTIP and ESCCP YouTube channel, and you can access that at the link shown here. Today's broadcast will be listen only. Please submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A sessions to submit your questions. We do encourage you to get them in well in advance of the Q&A sessions, and we ask that when you submit your questions, to please add, add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you. Uh, please use the Q&A box for questions and the chat box for technical difficulties. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Kurt Preston, who is the startup and ESCCP program manager for resource conservation and resiliency. Dr. Preston has tracked his career between civilian university and military positions. And prior to his current position with CERTIP and ESCCP, Kurt was a faculty member and research administrator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he led faculty development efforts to improve research competitiveness. And in this position, Kurt also worked with technology transfer personnel, academic departments, and colleges to build research capability. In addition, he has served as a member of Chief of the Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Advisory Board. Third, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTIP and ESPCP webinar. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. 
CERDIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERDIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impact real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERDIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the laboratory and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERDIP and ESTCP are complementary programs, with much of CERDIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are several environmental drivers for the type of work funded by CERDIP and ESTCP, with the underlying objective of sustaining Department of Defense ranges, facilities, and operations. This, as you can imagine, is a broad undertaking. It takes the form of looking at maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, climate impacts, unexploded ordnance and munition constituents, as well as other environmental drivers. One key environmental driver is the reduction of current and future environmental liabilities. This involves addressing contamination for past practices, including impacts to groundwater, soils and sediments, unexploded ordnance contamination, and developing management approaches for contaminants of emerging concern. The second part of this is pollution prevention, with a focus on eliminating likely environmental pollutants or hazardous materials in manufacturing, maintenance, and operations of our installations. We have several main focus areas for research and demonstration at CERDIP and ESTCP as shown here. As mentioned earlier, technology transfer is a very important aspect within CERDIP and ESTCP programs. Technology transfer efforts include the development of videos, training workshops, and guidance documents. The webinar series is a substantial component of our technology transfer efforts. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from all of our program areas. Upcoming topics include demonstration and validation of non-invasive technology to assess contaminant storage in low permeability media and rock matrix, corrosion mitigation and predictive analysis for Department of Defense weapon systems, results from testing advanced microgrid control algorithms, characterizing and treating PFAS source zones and others. Registration is open for webinars throughout the year. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. All past webinars are archived and can be assessed using this link. Please save the date for the 2022 CERDIP and ESCCP Symposium, which will be held November 29 to December 2nd in Arlington, Virginia. This event will showcase the latest technologies 
that enhance Department of Defense mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Finally, I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar webpage. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. And I certainly hope that you enjoy the webinar today. Thank you so much, Kurt. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Susan Cohen, who is the Associate Director of the University of North Carolina Institute for the Environment and Director of the Car Carolina Drone Lab in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, in these positions, Susan works with interdisciplinary teams on applied research for ecosystem management and resilience across habitat, habitat types. Uh, prior to joining UNC, Susan worked as a biologist for the Naval Facilities Engineering and Expeditionary Warfare Center, and she ran the CERTA funded Defense Coastal Estuarine Research Program at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune in Eastern North Carolina. And before she joined DOD, Susan worked at the US Forest Service at the Southern Research Station in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina as a research biologist focused on fire-adapted forest ecosystems and plant communities. She earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a master's and a doctoral degree in forestry from North Carolina State University. Susan, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. And I already accidentally advanced to one slide, so I'll go ahead and uh, jump right in. I'm really excited to tell everybody about this project. I'll present this topic first, focusing on the specifics of the ESTCP project that we affectionately call READY, the Regional Drone Demonstration for Installations and Environment, and then provide a little bit more information about natural resource applications and opportunities for DOD civilians. And I really should say for, for anybody looking to bring drones into their organization. And you'll see that these natural resource applications and opportunities are things that we've discovered as we've executed this ESTC pre project. So really lessons learned. And by the end, I shouldn't have to tell you about the benefits to DOD if I've done my job here today. So jumping right in. Have you all been able to hear me this whole time? I apologize for the difficulties. We're set, just proceed, Susan. Very good, thank you, Rula, I appreciate that. I'm not gonna go back to that previous slide and tell you the problem. I'm just gonna tell you about my experience 15 years ago when I first flew a drone at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. It was a DJI Phantom of all things. And the only way to do it was to create this special range request to fill out a form and create my own process and submit it up the chain and get permission to fly. That, that was the only way to do it. And is what it, that, that process does is eliminates all opportunity for anything on demand. And it's so onerous that it sort of becomes a little bit defeating. And after time, I was less likely to create these special range requests. They were just too time consuming. And every time is a repeat of the same action. So the idea is, why don't we create this strategic framework that, um, that eliminates this, this constant repetition? So this framework that we created as part of this ESTCP project ready is composed of four parts. And I think these parts are applicable to any organization that really does want to incorporate drones into their work. So obviously training, you have to know what you're doing. Mission kits, you need something to fly protocols, what are those underlying things that are supporting your program? Have you codified the pathways? And then demonstrations to really show these natural resource applications. And rather than just do it at one installation, Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, where we started, the idea is let's take it to the region. 
This is essentially a repeat of the last slide, but I love this photo so much. I wanted to show it really quickly. We were flying at, we being the project team, we're flying at Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island a couple weeks ago, mapping some marshes with them. And they have been looking for the pipe in the middle of that image for about 18 months. And you can't just send people mucking out into the middle of an expansive marsh. It was too small to see on satellite and they can't access this area by boat. So it just was another just added little bonus from flying that day to be able to show them that. Um, again, I won't go back. I'm having a little bit of click anxiety here, I suppose, but we worked at all the Marine Corps installations east, which are composed of Camp Lejeune, Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point, Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort, Marine Corps Recruit Depot Paris Island, Marine Corps Logistics Base Albany, and Marine Corps Staying Facility Blunt Island. The idea here is that all of these installations, except for Albany, which is a little bit more interior, face the same type of climate resilience issues. Storm surge, sea level rise, eroding shorelines, infrastructure that can't be moved, that's right up on a marsh that may be eroding. So we're allowed this opportunity to address similar issues on multiple installations while still allowing those installations to develop their own specific guidelines and needs. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. We're turning back to our structure that's made up of four parts. This is the first part that's training. Training is two weeks, eight hours a day, three professional teachers for eight students. So it was very intensive and the idea here is twofold. Make sure everybody knows what they're doing and is ready to rock when we leave and provide enough assurance to commanders that the training process was really rigorous. So we combined the part 107 FAA, which is really just a paper test. You can get your part 107 FAA pilot certificate without ever flying a drone. It's comprehensive in multiple topics, but it's not hands-on. So to complete that piece, we added what's called buck training. That's a Marine Corps level training that brings on a certain amount of hands-on hours and a certain amount of practice exercises with a particular drone. We combined those two things and we created a training protocol that has been accepted by Marine Corps Installations East as the standard for civilians. So that was the super important first piece. We'll see if I can get this slide changing right. The second piece is a mission kit. You have to have something to fly. And these are not programs of record. So there is no um, line item budget to, to replace equipment, to buy equipment. So the thinking here is, let's get these guys up and running. Let's provide these installations with everything they need to carry them through several years with the instruction that every single mission they fly, they need to document cost savings. So if you replace three Cessna surveys over an installation for what on whatever, maybe they're surveying the landfill, which is actually something installations do with occupied aircraft, document the cost savings. Because then when you turn around and need to replace that equipment, if you can demonstrate savings and demonstrate safety, then you're more likely to get stuff funded. I do genuinely believe these things will eventually become programs of record, but this is an issue until that day. So the first mission kit consisted of a Paradinafi thermal, which is designed for both situational awareness, super rapid deployment. You can also do really high quality mapping with it. And a SenseFly EBX, which is a mapping drone that's fixed wing. Following the 2020 NDAA, we were no longer allowed to use those drones. And now we are swapping to the Vantage Robotics Vesper, which is a blue drone, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. The third piece of our operational framework is to codify protocols and programs. So at our, I'll say instigation, we got together with the MCI East leadership to include airspace managers and range managers um, and some extremely helpful Marines who were running the drone side of the house. And we constructed an actual Marine Corps order for all the MCI East um, installations. And the, there's multiple ideas here. One is to go ahead and get on paper what the requirements are. So civilians can discover it and walk through that process. The other reason is to provide a little bit of long-term stability because of that rotating door with commanding officers and commanding generals. So every time one comes in, they go, what is this? Are you kidding? We're not letting these civilians fly drones on our installations. 
And then the order can be provided, the other requirements can be provided, and you have a little bit easier pathway to get the new leadership up and running and to understand a program that's in place. We did our first order several years ago, and without any prompting from us, the order has been renewed and updated to reflect the new NDAA, and we think that represents a real institutionalization of the drone program. So we're super excited about that. We also, of course, provide um, user guidance and templates for risk mitigation and all types of things like that. The last piece is demonstrations. And it's at this moment, we really concentrate on taking those drone skills and applying it to collect data that becomes information to inform management. And is what the students quickly learn is that the same few steps at the beginning apply to any kind of mission. It's oftentimes just the information you extract on the back end. So the example I have up here is coastal because again, all of these installations that we worked on with the exclusion of Albany are coastal, how do you monitor your marshes? It's one thing to say marshes are eroding, it's another thing to quantify it. So it's really a great opportunity to start putting hard numbers and have on demand that goes right back to that, not having to go through that process every time, on demand ability to collect imagery and information about coastal processes. We have learned um, a lot of lessons um, from the last three-ish, three and a half years working on this program and developing this along with our end users and stakeholders. And these are a few things that I think apply across the board to any installation, and again, to any installation or to any organizations, even that aren't DOD. You have to be the expert on drones. And I don't mean the military side of the house, I mean the civilian side of the house. The leadership, I get, in the majority of cases, the leadership at installations do not know the rules about flying drones. A lot of them think you can't do it as civilians, and that is not true. There is no DOD memorandum at a high level that says you cannot fly drones on an installation. Your commanding officer may say that, and that's their prerogative, but there's no DOD rule there. You have to rely on leadership and staff and you have to brief them early and you have to brief them often. So this is an investment of your time. Um, this is laying down the groundwork and being you know, sort of the pioneer and every step of the way you will brief and, and you will inform and you'll bring people along with you. And of course, flexibility. Anybody who's worked on a DOD installation for any amount of time knows flexibility is key to success. So expanding it a little bit now, thinking a little bit more about natural resource applications that may apply to your installation or your organization, I kind of divide things up into two categories, situational awareness. And in that particular category, fire is my absolute favorite use. And I'll show you a little bit more um, about that in just a second. The other thing I like is long-term monitoring. Again, because it's on demand, you defined your temporal scale. So perhaps you're monitoring something pre and post storm. seasonally over several quarters of year, just about unparalleled. The one thing I really want to focus on on this particular slide are the bottom two images, because this really gets to what you can accomplish in a day. Those um, images are from Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. They are Onslow Beach, the amphibious training facility. The top long rectangular image, I can circle this little box here, is what we can map using terrestrial LIDAR with one day. We're mapping the beach there for a variety of reasons to understand things like dune height and morphology. So when storms do hit, we know what to anticipate. We can monitor change over time. We can monitor specific areas for upcoming training events. We can look for new splash zones for amphibious vehicles to cross over the island, cross through the intracoastal um, waterway and then onto the mainland, variety of uses for terrestrial LIDAR mapping, but it is shockingly slow. The bottom rectangular image, what I could do in a day with the EVX. We didn't use lot of structure for motion. Susan, you are cutting in and out. Can you restart at slide 32?
just bear with us a moment while we try to figure out a way to get uh, Susan back on. Just hold, please. Are you back, Susan? I am. My apologies, and I will keep things moving. And I have will call into the conference line also. Yes, please, please do. So we'll resume in about fifteen seconds here. In the meantime, while I'm calling in, slide thirty-three, please. Just a little other reinforcement of how drones can be used to monitor infrastructure and threats. In this case, it's due to sea level rise. That bottom right image is from Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island. And you can clearly see the infringement of the marsh right up on that roadway. That can be tracked by a drone at a moment's notice and on demand, pre-storm, post-storm, and just to come up with mitigation efforts as well. Slide 34. This is one of my favorite slides. I took this imagery at Falls Lake, North Carolina to help a graduate student lay out some restoration plots. Not only the image on the right is from Google Earth, you can clearly see just the color difference with the drone imagery on the left set on top. So just analyzing habitat type, looking for features on the landscape is greatly enhanced by using drone imagery. But if I scroll in a little bit more, slide 35, You can really start to see the detail there. That is three, less than three centimeter pixels at 400 feet. And we were able to find some stream blockages that they had been trying to figure out what was backing up water coming around the bend. Slide 36, please. Again, fire is just an extraordinary use for drones and I love it for situational awareness. If you are a fire manager and you can put a drone up during a prescribed fire, you can look for your escape routes. Are they clear? Find your gear, find your equipment, find your people. Are your fire lines holding? Where do you have hot spots that you weren't anticipating as the fire front moves forward? The uses are endless and safety is really at the forefront here. Not to mention your pre and post burn applications. Really assess how well your burns are doing. Check out your crown scorch. Just using a regular, RGB, red, green, blue sensor can get you a shocking amount of information. You have a thermal, it gets even better. Slide 37. I put this slide in here specifically because it is not a natural resource use, but we get more traction on installations when we bring in other stakeholders who have a lot of sway on an installation. When you are working on an air station, you must work with the airfield manager and the airspace manager. And if you show additional uses that they can get behind, they're far more likely to support your efforts. When I work at Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point, I don't get to fly anywhere we want. There are still places that we can't fly because they simply make the airspace managers too nervous. And that's fine. But we have about 50% of the base where we can fly. We're proving ourselves, we're showing our safety record, and now we're also talking about uses that they can really get behind, like assessing runway condition. Again, instead of saying our runway is um, in poor condition, you can monitor the change over time. And then when a commanding general looks over to an airspace manager and says, are you behind this? Does this sound okay to you? Your airspace manager's in the loop. They know what you're doing and they're far more likely to be your advocate than anything else. And that's a really important part of these programs on DOD installations. You need people to be your advocates. Slide 38, please. I wanted to bring this up, even though I know many of you don't have access to machine learning software or capabilities, and that's fine. So maybe tuck this away for future uses. We're using this a lot now um, at, at my drone lab at UNC. And I, you know, maybe you have no access to a program called Deep Forest, which by the way is open source. 
But I know a lot of people keep a standalone laptop on installations. Sometimes they're connected to a network, sometimes they're not. So maybe there is an opportunity to bring something like this into your world. There's also an option to use it in ARC. Now, it is not a standard toolbox in ArcGIS, the machine learning supervised classification for many of you, but it's a lot easier to bring an additional application from ARC into an environment where you're already using it. So think about these things in the background. We're using it heavily in forestry right now. We're counting trees. We're looking for um, communities of specific species that maybe indicate a habitat type. So it is just our next step. And even if it's not available to you now, maybe you have a contractor who can help you with this. So just something to kind of think about and keep in your back pocket. Slide 39, please. You've heard most of this already, but I wanna dive in a little bit to the cyber secure drones, because that's really a hitch for a lot of people. And you have a couple of options that I'm gonna talk about in the next slide, but I wanna emphasize one thing. And this is something I run into with commanding officers and generals all the time. A cyber waiver does not give you permission to fly, but you need a flag officer signature to get a cyber waiver. And this will make a little bit more sense in a minute, but it never fails that I send a waiver request up the chain to be signed. And the first question I get is, well, you don't have permission to fly. Why are you doing this? And my answer is, this is not permission to fly. This is simply assuring you that my drone is cyber secure. So you'll get this question a lot. You'll just take a deep breath and you'll answer it again. Um, but it's important that you have a response to this question when it comes back down the chain to you. And the process varies by service and we'll get a smidgen into that. Um, but I will say everything is discoverable. It is shocking what you can find out there that paves the pathway for any service and any installation to fly. But at the end of the day, the leadership on an installation are the final call. Slide 40, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about blue and non-blue drones. Again, cybersecurity is, is what we're talking about here. Con th that second bullet, I I'll say it twice. Contractors do not get to bypass the rules. Do not let a contractor fly on your base if they do not have either a blue drone or a waiver in hand. Those are the rules and don't let them mess it up for the rest of us. So contractors follow our rules. There is a little bit of nuance that I'm not gonna get into today, um, but in general, they must, th th there's, no, there's no nuance with them having a waiver or a blue drone. There's just a little bit of nuance in some other aspects. Uh, so the NDA 2020 is what got us into this and the enforcement of it. And you may not fly a drone that has any type of computing equipment that is from China. Every single drone you fly will have batteries from China. There's no way around that, and that's fine. You can get a waiver for that. That or Even the blue drones have batteries from China in some cases. So parts like propellers, those are also fine. So that's the difference there. That's what we're looking for, non-computing parts. The list on the right is the current list of um, blue, Drones, drones you don't need a waiver for. That list has probably changed since I made this slide. And I can tell you the majority of blue drones were not designed for our applications. They were designed for military tactical use. And when you start trying to map with them, that's when you figure it out. And you have to do a lot of the legwork yourself. There's a couple of exceptions. The other thing about blue drones is their cost. I find them to be almost cost prohibitive. I, in the future, although I bought blue drones for this ESTCP project that I started talking about at the beginning of the slide deck, in the future, I will probably only do commercial off-the-shelf drones with waivers until the prices come down. I just don't think that they're reasonable right now. Um, so, well, we can probably talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A, I have a feeling. So, blue drones... They are established cyber secure, no waiver. You bring them right to the base, but then you get all your other permissions. Non drones, commercial off the shelf, you go get a waiver. Some uh, more and more drones are waiverable because companies know what's happening. They may not have a blue drone, but they've got a blue, they've got a drone you can get a waiver on. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. About that. Fly 41, please. 
So this is another reinforcement, but is what I've done this slide. Susan, we've lost you again. So let's make sure you restart at slide 41 when you get back. Full of starting points to go find the requirements and I'll get a waiver for you. Thank you, Rula. How is now? Now it's good. Great. Th these are just links for folks to be able to start that process of discovering how to get a waiver for their service. So this slide is Army and Navy. Slide 42, please. Air Force and Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they, they also have processes. The Army Corps of Engineers has an individual program. It is led by an amazing woman. And Army installations have the option of going with them or not going with them. And I've seen both things happen. When I last flew on an Army installation, they were not following US ACE protocols. They had established their own through the Army Board. But there are lots of pathways is the main point here. Slide 43, please. This is the last one I have. And I think the benefits are pretty easy to wrap around. But I think there are benefits at every level, right? An installation level benefit is great information, great data to inform decision making. And perhaps you can collect data in places you never did. Maybe there need to be rattlesnake surveys in an impact area. Instead of paying um, Explosive Ordnance Division to walk you in there and you can only cover a certain amount, fly a drone. So there's all kinds of interesting uses on installations. At the regional level, it's nice to have protocols in place. And it's what we're trying to do in this ESTC project is have the drone pilots at each installation in the region work with each other and support each other. And then the larger benefit to DOD is clearly supporting the mission through sound natural resource management. Slide 44, please, Rula. This is just a shout out to the team. Um, this has been a very person and labor heavy project because there's a lot of moving parts with a lot of expertise. So they're amazing. And that is my last slide. My sincere apologies for the technical difficulties. And I will end there, Rula. Great, thank you so much, Susan. We did receive a number of questions just a reminder for all of you, please use the Q&A box on your screen for questions. And there's still time to get them in, but we did receive several ones on this first portion of the webinar that Susan will now answer. Susan, the first question is from uh, Mantec, and it has to do with the cyber certification. Does it include data post-processing, such as the use of uh, cloud-based applications? Great question. And I'll start including that in my slides now. It does not. How you process your data at the end is between you and your installation and probably your GIS office. I have yet to find a group at DOD that can do cloud-based. Everyone is doing it on standalones. But I do think cloud-based through, in the Marine Corps, it would be GeoFidelis, is coming in the future, for sure. But no. The cyber waiver has nothing to do with post-processing. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is a question from Civil and Environmental Consultant. Are you able to fit LiDAR scanners on the Vantage Vesper drone or are LiDAR scans done by larger ones? The, um, several of those drones are not able to carry a swappable payload. And I'm not looking at the list right now, but just off the top of my head, the Anafi, for example, and the Vesper, those are fixed payloads and they cannot carry a LIDAR. Something like the FreeFly Alta X, which would be overkill because it's a massive heavy lift drone, has a swap over payload and you can carry LIDAR. Now, sensors are included in the cyber waiver. And um, you always have to include your sensor and make sure that there is nothing transmittable happening on the drone. So all of your data collection has to happen onto your SD card or whatever the mechanism is on that individual drone, and then you download it separately. So that's just, you didn't ask that, but I wanted to tack that on. So several of those drones do have swappable payloads, and if you can afford a LiDAR sensor, it would be amazing to, to, to use that technology. Great, thank you. This next uh, question 
Flash comment is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. Uh, a satellite can take pictures of the same position on Earth over long periods of time to allow for the creation of consistent images that so show environmental change over time. Having said this, is it possible to position a drone with comparable precision to that of a satellite that would produce images that illustrate measurable environmental change? I think I understand that question. Um, and I'll start by saying one issue we have with satellites is clouds and atmospheric disruptions to being able to see what we want to see. Unless you're dealing with something like STAR, right? Um, synthetic aperture radar, which can see through everything. So a little bit of a depends there. The way I've been seeing folks team satellite and drone data up a lot is drone truthing the satellite data. I have yet now, I'm sure there are private satellites that have resolution that are extraordinary, and I'm not privy to those in any way. But the public satellites, the data that's kind of readily available, your big favorite ones like Landsat, and GOI, and pick your favorite one, Sentinel, um, the, the resolution of those is, is great, but it is not three centimeters. So there's, there's some really um, just fine scale resolution that drones give you that satellites don't, but you clearly know already by the question that satellites cover so much more acreage. So, so can we do some truthing with the drones and then extract even more data from the satellite? I, I have a prediction that in 10 years, we will not be using drones the way we are now to map change over time because the satellites are going to be so good. I, I shouldn't say not at all, but I think the instances will become less and less. And I'm not sure I answered that question, so please follow up if, if, if I didn't really get it, what you were talking about. Yes, and as a reminder, you can all download the slides on the link that I uh, included in the chat box for all of you. And Susan's information is on the slide prior to this. So you've got her email and phone number. All right, Susan, another question for you. This is from the Oahu Army Natural Research Program at DPW Schofield Barracks. Uh, is there a standard template for the cyber waiver uh, that can be shared? Each service has their own template. Several of them are only accessible with a cat card. So when I left, you know, when I left DOD, I didn't have a cat card anymore. So now when I need to see the updates to the template, I have to ask somebody with a cat card to go get it. So most, and I'm, I, I'm gearing up to fly in an Air Force base in the spring, so I haven't gone through their process yet, so I can't tell you for them yet, um, but there is a template and it is service specific. And that's what you end up doing. You know, you end up copying and pasting. So once you get through that first waiver, that's the hardest one, especially if you're using the same drone over and over again. And for most waivers, they're at least six months. So you sort of get into this pattern. And once the waiver boards get used to you and they see what you're doing and you keep repeating yourself, it's really not a bad process. Um, I Yeah, so everyone does have a template. And for the Marine Corps DO, um, Navy one, the link is in the slide. And you'll have to have a cat card. And you'll have to do a little bit of digging to get to the Air Force one. I'll let you know if I get there sooner, though. Great, thank you, Susan. This next question is from Atos Environmental. You mentioned an exception in regards to the use of the blue drones with a natural resource application. What is that exception? Ooh, what did I say? I'm not exactly sure what I said. So you have there is no exception to using a drone that either is blue or has a cyber waiver. There are some interesting things with contractors. For example, if you go get, a, if you are a Department of Defense civilian and you are getting a waiver for a commercial off the shelf drone, that drone must have a certificate of airworthiness, what's called an IFC. And a ton of drones have them. That is the exception to a contractor. A contractor can go get a waiver for a drone, but they do not need an IFC to fly on the installation. Now, again, commanding officers and commanding generals run their bases. And if they say, sorry, 
contractor has to have one. I don't even think a commander would know that. But so there are some nuance. I think that might be what you're alluding to, but please follow up if it's not. IFC is interim flight clearance, and they call it a certificate of airworthiness, though. So it's one of these weird things where acronym doesn't match the actual thing. All right, thank you, Susan. One last question because before we switch over to David's presentation. So if you could keep the response brief, but uh, this is all very compelling information that you presented, but what sort of cost savings can be realized through the use of UAS? And can you provide some examples if they're available? My favorite example is the flying of the landfill. When I won't name the installation, but they spent thousands of dollars to fly their landfill twice a year to estimate volume. And we did it with the drone in about an hour. So yeah, you had to buy the drone, but if you use the drone over and over again and you start to do the calculation over time, it's a pretty significant cost savings. And I'll tell you the one thing you can't put a cost savings on is safety. And I'll throw out one more example, even though I wasn't asked. I have had colleagues who have died in aircraft doing Southern Pine Beetle surveys. If you can keep your people out of aircraft, keep your people out of aircraft. I don't know how you monetize that. That is a horrible thing to have to think about. But um, you, can, you, you can realize savings and benefits in multiple ways. But that landfill is the best one I have. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. We still have some questions that we haven't gotten to. We'll try and get to those at the end of the presentation. But it is now time to thank you, Susan. and. Um, switch gears to our second speaker, Mr. David Delaney, uh, who is a research wildlife biologist uh, with the U.S. Army Construction Engineering Research Lab in Champaign, Illinois. David focuses on assessing the potential effects of anthropogenic disturbances on threatened, endangered, and species of concern, and also testing and demonstration of field technology for natural resource applications on state, federal, and DOD lands across the United States. Prior to joining the DOD, uh, David worked for Rocky Mountain Research Station with the US Forest Service in Arizona and for various uh, nonprofit research organizations. He earned a bachelor's degree in wildlife management from the University of New Hampshire and a master's degree from Northern Arizona University. David, please proceed. Yeah, thank you, Rula. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to present uh, today. I'll be talking today about our um, study, a demonstration project on data fuel unmanned aircraft systems to remotely uh, download ground sensors on military lands. Um, the slide's going a little bit slow here, so let me see if I can. Uh... Okay. All right, so I wanted to give you some information on the presentation outline. Um, I'll be first discussing general information about ground sensors for collecting field data. Um, then I'll follow that with description on various factors that can impact the access to ground sensors and hinder data collection. Uh, the primary discussion I'll be talking about today We'll be presenting data we collected when demonstrating the data mule technology on the barium goldwater range east and the naval base ventura county um, then following that i'll talk about some of the advantages of technology compared to the standard method which was uh, for for barium goldwater range somebody actually manually going out and uh, driving to and walking to these sites uh, to, to collect data from the ground sensors um, and then i'll discuss some of the benefits of the technology for the dod and other land management agencies. Um, and then our final uh, discussion on the overall uh, conclusions of the demonstration project. Uh, the figures we have shown here are of the three different field sites that we were doing work on, the Barium Goldwater Range East, which is in southwest uh, Arizona. Uh, it's a very large installation, uh, 1.1 million acres um, on the eastern part, which is administered by Luke Air Force Base. Uh, the middle uh, photograph there is a, it's a Naval Base Ventura County, Point Magoo, uh, again, Southern California with the, with the Navy, and then San Nicolas Island, which is off the coast of Southern California. Uh, so those were the three sites uh, that we we're doing some work on this uh, for this project. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, 
the benefits of ground sensors to the DOD. Uh, the advent of ground sensors has greatly increased the ability of researchers and resource uh, managers to collect data for, for extended periods of time, especially in remote areas and, and in hospital areas. So having a ground sensor that, again, has its own power source is able to, to extend and collect important inf information. And there's sensors that can collect a variety of different types of information. Uh, specifically, uh, we were looking at camera traps. Um, so again, the benefit of these is you can automatically collect a variety of different things from, from video to pictures to uh, water gauges, whatever that might be for natural resource and other sort of applications. Um, and these data can also be very important for development of integrated natural resource management plans for the DOD. Uh, this project specifically used camera traps, as I mentioned, as a representative ground sensor. Um, but, uh, and one of the main reasons for that too, is that the host um, military partners for these projects had current projects that were using camera traps. So we would be able to do a, a, a robust comparison between how they're collecting information in real time versus how we're collecting information with our system. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about factors affecting data access. Um, so, you know, one, one question is, is there a more effective way than collecting it with the standard method, having some big going out, driving uh, on these very difficult roads sometimes to access these, hiking up uh, steep canyons. Again, uh, Susan was talking about that uh, earlier, just the whole aspect of, of personal safety and going out and collecting this information. One of the primary methods again, is, is manually visiting site, these sites, uh, exchanging data cards, collecting, uh, changing the batteries, those kind of things to maintain the site. Um, but this can be time consuming, costly, and can increase the risk to personnel working in these remote areas. Um, it's important to have consistent access to ground sensors, but this can be restricted due to um, weather that causes uh, outages on the roads. Um, again, military training events specifically for DOD, which uh, can reduce access for, for days, weeks, and even months. Um, and then exclusion from areas because of sensitive periods, such as a nesting uh, period for a bird colony. Person's not able to get in there maybe for two or three months or longer, and they have a system set up not being able to access that system, the batteries could uh, fail, the, 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 the card could fill up, and you're not able to maintain those sites as regularly as you want to. Um, so having another method to be able to collect that information would be important. These delays in acquisition can, again, lead to data loss, um, which can be important to, um, um, you know, again, can influence an ongoing study. So it's important to keep these, uh, these different technologies going. Um, so there's a technology, a need for technology that can facilitate more consistent data collection to help natural resource managers be more adaptive and, time, uh, and timely in their management decisions. Um, so there's a need for more cost-effective alternatives in collecting this data from ground sensors compared to the existing kind of conventional um, methods that I mentioned. So I wanna talk a little bit about the technology in, in our approach. Um, the pictures here, we have the uh, example of the VTOL uh, UAS, so vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, this is the unit you were using here. Uh, the middle uh, images of the data mule payload that was up underneath the airframe itself that we'd use to actually collect the information. And then we have the communication station. Um, so that's where you have your kind of inner workings of the system. Um, you have your, your, your camera trap, you have your solar panel, and then you have the communication box that will communicate with the with the uh, airframe itself to be able to communicate and, and transmit information. Um, so the objective of this project was to demonstrate and validate this data mule system uh, as an effective, safe, and cost-effective method for accessing and retrieving data from ground sensors on military installations. We wanted to demonstrate this on military installations, especially because it's important, because it's a unique um, kind of way of collecting data. They have unique kind of restrictions um, because of military uses and training. Uh, the objectives, again, were to demonstrate this in effective, uh, to effectively deploy it, uh, and to consistently download and manage data from the camera traps. And we wanted to validate the effectiveness of this um, system compared to, again, the common practice of accessing camera traps manually um, by vehicle and by foot. Um, and one important aspect of this is the system can be integrated with a variety of uh, ground sensors, but again, we were specifically field testing with camera traps uh, as part of this uh, work. Uh, it's important, it's important to, uh, to note that the data mule um, system itself works with a variety of UAS, not just with fixed wing, hover to forward flight units that, that we were using. 
So I want to talk a little bit um, about the um, fail safe and kind of the download process for this system. Uh, the data mule UES automatically flies to and circles around each sensor site as data is wirelessly uh, downloaded from the ground sensor and stored on board uh, the payload, as I mentioned, as I showed a picture of earlier. And then that's returned to, to the flight crew uh, as a designated takeoff and landing zone. Uh, to avoid data loss in the event of a crash of the airframe, um, specifically the UAS data mule has a novel software that uses a two-pass data management process to ensure that the uh, sensor data is um, only cleared from uh, each ground sensor on the next flight after it has been uh, retrieved by the flight crew. Uh, the user interface allows the user to select a specific download time out period uh, for how long the UAS will overfly and download data from each ground station before continuing on to another mission or returning home. That's an important aspect to that, to be able to actually set what your download uh, timeout period is, depending on the number of photographs you might have in a unit, you can change that time frame from 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever that might be, to allow yourself a unit to, to be able to, uh, to hover over, to, to be able to uh, loiter over, to be able to collect that information. And I wanted to show you a picture here um, of one of the uh, user interface screens. Um, so this shows an example of user interface illustrating the kind of the data output from, from a station. Um, so what one of the missions, you know, once the mission is complete and the US has returned, UAS has returned uh, to base, the user is able to access through this through the software to determine kind of what proportion of photographs were downloaded, how many photographs were downloaded, the size of those data files, um, and um, also what the download speed was uh, for each station that was visited. And this is important for determining if additional flights are needed and then how much time would be needed, as I mentioned earlier, that might be needed to set that down, that, uh, that period of time to, to loiter over to, to kind of follow up and to end up downloading the remaining uh, images. I'd like to get into a little bit of our Barium Go Water Range East sites um, results from 2019. Again, we conducted dozens of successful autonomous data download flights across the field sites on Barium Go Water Range East. We downloaded thousands of images associated uh, with those camera traps that were collecting uh, information at these uh, water sites that are of interest to the installation. Um, and this shows a picture of a water catchment site uh, specifically. So the installation's interested in understanding uh, what uh, wildlife species are utilizing uh, these things and trying, trying to provide additional resources for this hot and dry kind of environment uh, for the animals themselves. Um, we downloaded, again, thousands of images from these long distance flights that range from roughly three to 10 kilometers in length. Um, we also conducted multiple missions from a single landing zone and then multiple missions from uh, during a single flight. Um, we were authorized by the Air Force to conduct, also to conduct beyond visual line of sight flights as well as beyond telemetry range. Uh, and this image I have here on the top showing the multiple flight um, this was an instance where we were able to go to multiple sites to download information, but we were also able to um, investigate and, and demonstrate that capability of beyond visual line of sight and beyond telemetry range. Um, so that was important uh, characteristics as well to be able to show. And I want to talk a little bit about the um, Naval Base Ventura County results from 2020. Again, um, similarly, uh, like the uh, Barium Go Water Range, we had uh, dozens of successful flights um, on this installation. We downloaded uh, many photographs from the camera traps that were monitoring uh, sensitive bird species, both the clapper rail on Point Magoo and then the Brant's cormorants on San Nicolas Island. Um, again, both all these administered by the Ventura County um, Naval Base. Um, the flight distances to field sites were, were shorter on Naval Base Ventura County, so um, there were more opportunities to kind of conduct multiple missions from a single landing zone and during a single flight. Uh, we did not observe any negative responses from shorebirds in the areas during our, our flights themselves. Um, you see, see some images here of, uh, of an air airframe with one of our colleagues here on the project um, doing a mission. This shows a picture here in the middle on the data station on San Nicolas Island. Uh, this is before nesting happened with the brain cormorant. But you can see the, the nests from the previous year that the, the cormorants would come back and nest on and the setup with the, the communication station and the, uh, and the solar panel. And then again, the, the um, camera trap taking a picture of those. And then the data station on Point Magoo, this was a different setup. This was 
um, one that was for the clapper rail that had to be on a platform, a floating platform, um, and, uh, and, and allow us to collect the information uh, that these are platforms that the, uh, the clapper rails would, would nest on uh, during the summer. Um, so just to give you an idea of what those looked like. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of the temporal and spatial comparisons um, that we made. And this, these data would be specific for um, Barham Goldwater Range because, uh, again, we had the ability to go in um, both manually to collect information as well as through the UAS. While on, uh, on uh, Point Magoo and Naval Base Ventura County, because the animals were nesting, we weren't able to go in um, and make that same direct comparison. So these data would be specific to Barium Goldwater Range. Um, so what we found was the average travel time and distances were consistently shorter for the UAS flights compared to the vehicles. As you would expect, um, as the kind of crow flies, um, it'd be quicker to fly with a drone than to drive on some of these roads. Uh, the images here you see in yellow on the picture kind of show the um, straight line. Um, so that bottom, bottom part, it says site 584. That one is where our takeoff and landing was. And so we had straight shots to be able to go um, to, to the kind of to the north east and to the uh, northwest and then to the east to be able to get to those sites while the different colored lines um, the orange and blue and white and some of the red show you the drive uh, distances so again longer distances for the driving than the, than the flights so on average flights to and from data stations would take um, 11.4 minutes over a distances of uh, 6.8 kilometers while it would take uh, upwards of 48 uh, 0.1 minutes um, over a distance of 10.4 kilometers by vehicle. Uh, again, most mo roads were very uh, rugged and slower to travel on, especially as you get closer to the uh, water catchment sites themselves. These sites were purposely put out in uh, fairly remote areas that the animals could uh, access again during the uh, difficult kind of summer periods with the hot and dry conditions. Uh, the total time to access and download data varied between methods and according to the number of um, sites being monitored. It took about 1.2 hours to drive and hike to an individual site uh, from the uh, DLZ, which is a designated landing zone, to exchange data cards and download the, the data compared to 1.4 hours for the data mule. But that's just one site. When we looked at examining it over five sites, where we had one place where we could take off and land and then do um, multiple site flights as well as flights from that one position, uh, things kind of reversed in the pattern in the amount of time. So we examined on a five, uh, site basis, and we found the reverse pattern, where it was quicker for the data mule UAS uh, than the vehicles. It, it took 4.5 hours to download data from multiple, those multiple five sites, um, compared to 6.6 .6 hours for the vehicle. And a lot of this has to do with the time savings in not having to take down and set up the, the drone itself. If you have one location, you can take off from you can do multiple flights from, you save a lot of time um, compared to the driving, which again had to drive out to each one of these individually. Um, so again, we couldn't conduct a similar sort of uh, uh, examination for um, Naval Base Ventura County because again, restrictions during the breeding season. I'd like to talk to um, some of the advantages of the data mule UAS. Um, so there's a number of advantages um, compared to the standard method. Um, the data can be accessed more quickly and safely from the air than by accessing field sites by ground. Um, the, the system is especially beneficial when, when there's needs to ac need to access um, during uh, when ground access accessibility is restricted, especially um, on military bases, you might have ground access uh, restricted for training purposes, uh, but you might be able to get in there for from an aerial perspective, so that's important consideration. Uh, the ability to access data more frequently and consistently using the data mule system uh, lessens with the potential uh, for data loss on sites where access can be limited or restricted. Consistent data collection helps resource managers be more proactive in their management decisions. An example would be having data um, on what type of predator is uh, depredating a, a bird colony. Again, someone not be able to get in there and see uh, what was happening consistently. They have to wait four or five months to, to get that data versus if they can go in and fly more frequently every couple of weeks or so, they can have that information and be able to incorporate that sort of information into their management decisions. Um, so again, the, the important point too, the data mule system is able to work with a variety of sensors uh, and UAS, um, and also reducing the need or frequency to visit uh, field sites by road and hiking can reduce the risk uh, to field personnel when traveling into these very remote sites, um, lessening the potential for, uh, again, 
having people out there, more time they're traveling out to these sites, more chances of vehicle breakdowns, flat tires and things like that, especially in these remote areas can be, can be uh, difficult and dangerous situations. Um, and it can also lessen the amount of ground disturbance, which is especially important in sensitive habitat. Um, so here we have some pictures of um, some nesting uh, brant cormorants on San Nicolas Island. And then we have, a, again, a, a photograph here of a nest uh, depredation by a gull um, in that same colony. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the data mule uh, cost effectiveness. Um, so the data mule UES is most uh, cost effective when multiple missions can be conducted um, from a single takeoff and landing zone, as I talked about earlier, and when multiple stations can be visited during a single flight. Uh, so of course, this all depends on where the field sites are on the landscape. It's important when, um, when making those determinations of where your study sites are to look for uh, vantage points on the landscape where you can have a, a DLZ that might be a little bit elevated so you can have good uh, visibility to the, your different sites. You can set up uh, the ability to take off and land and visit multiple sites from that same takeoff and landing spot to maybe do multiple, um, you know, multi visit multiple sites from, during a single flight as well. Um, and so again, the, the cost benefit of the system improves with access to ground sensors, um, when, especially when it involves longer hiking distances on rough roads and when there's hiking distances to um, you know, ground stations take longer. So if you have a long drive and then you have to get out of the car and walk for an hour or two to get to your site, that's really where the, the aerial system helps um, you know, and, and there's more cost savings associated with that. Because as we all know, uh, the, the most expensive aspect to conducting uh, work on the ground, out in the field, on military bases and across different agencies and organizations is, is the personnel cost. So if we can have a technology that can provide um, more capability to those people to make their time more effective and lessen risks to them, it's very important. Um, And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, benefits to, to the DOD. Um, I have a couple of photographs here just showing uh, kind of one of the flights on BMGR East uh, with the airframe taking off and then something on, uh, again, on San Nicolas Island. Um, so one of the primary benefits of this system is the ability to collect data from the air when ground access is limited or restricted. This is especially important during sensitive uh, periods when ground access is not allowed, such as, as I mentioned earlier, with bird um, breeding colonies. The inability to collect uh, data for months at a time can lead to data loss if uh, sensors can't be maintained uh, or changed out of uh, storage cars and batteries as such. The ability of the system to work with a variety of sensors uh, across multiple UAS platforms is very important and illustrates the system's applicability across different studies and, and DOD facilities. Uh, the technology is scalable and can be used to collect data from a, across a different number of different sites and different sensor types uh, using the same airframe. Um, we found the system to be cost effective compared to the standard method uh, for collecting um, ground sensor data, especially when flights can again be conducted from a single takeoff landing zone and when the multiple flights can be visited during a single flight. Uh, the primary cost savings is the reduction in the amount of time field personnel need to access and download field data. And as I mentioned earlier, the personnel safety is a very important aspect um, that needs to be taken into account. Again, making people more effective and keeping them safe out in the landscape. Uh, so the fewer miles that are driven by field personnel lessens the chance of vehicle breakdowns or accidents and lessens the impact on the environment itself from people going out there time after time and walking over the same areas if they're sensitive habitat or potentially disturbing uh, disturbances to uh, sensitive species as well. And lastly, I'd like to uh, conclude. Um, we have some images here showing um, some images we recorded of Bobcat and mountain lion uh, using the, the systems. Um, so overall, we successfully demonstrated that the data mule technology was effective in collecting data from ground sensors across different environments in different branches of the, of the DOD. Um, the system is applicable across the Department of Defense and functions in concert with different UAS platforms and different types of sensors. Um, we found that the data mule system was cost effective compared to the standard uh, data collection method, particularly when flights could be conducted from single takeoff and the ability to collect multiple flights, um, multiple visits on a single flight. Uh, the system provides 
Most benefit with ground access, again, is limited or restricted, and with repeated ground access uh, to sensitive areas is a concern. Uh, the VTOL, again, a vertical takeoff and landing aspect, uh, UF, UAS that we used, was used um, for this demonstration and provided about 50 minutes of flight time and allowed us to conduct missions, again, over a very rugged uh, territory um, and be able to allow us to land it on very small parcels of land up in these uh, remote areas, which was very effective and, and beneficial for the project. Uh, the range of these systems was uh, upwards of 30 to 33 miles, uh, again, allowing us to, to conduct missions uh, over great distances. As I said, some of these were up to 10 uh, kilometers. And uh, I'd like to uh, finish with just acknowledging uh, the rest of the team uh, who are listed here um, from with the Navy, with our, um, uh, again, the, uh, with the Mission Mule, who was the uh, designers of the Data Mule uh, technology, and with the, uh, again, Luke Air Force Base, and with the, uh, with the Naval Base Ventura County. We especially like to thank, again, Luke Air Force Base, uh, Barium Goldwater Range East, uh, the 56th Range Management Office, uh, Naval Base Ventura County, and then the Point Magoo in San Nicolas Island and all the personnel that helped make this happen. And we especially like to thank uh, Dr. Kurt Preston and uh, our BSTCP staff for making this project happen and the funding opportunity for this. And uh, that is all I had. And I, I appreciate uh, everybody's time and uh, would certainly like to take any questions, uh, again, for additional information on this project and for ESTCP and uh, CERTIP, please see this uh, website here. And then if you have additional questions for me, I have my contact information, phone and email here and would appreciate uh, any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. We've received a number of questions for you. I'll start with one from the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Um, in order to fly the Firefly so far beyond the line of sight, is the use of repeaters or signal boosters needed? So um, again, we, we specifically did not need that. We were working with the um, with air management uh, on the installation. Um, again, this was just a kind of initial sort of demonstration. Um, we, again, we were doing things probably for that specific one, we were probably four or five kilometers from that site. We did not use any boosters. I could see situations where um, for, again, depending on what is in between where you are, um, what kind of radio and, and the quality of the radio that you're using for communication and connectivity that maybe boosters would be necessary. We did not specifically test that. Um, uh, you know, again, I can, I can try to uh, get some more additional information on that, but that's not something we specifically tested, but I could see situations where that might need to be done, especially if you are um, needing to do out of line of sight and beyond telemetry range on a consistent basis. Um, again, we were using, um, you know, pretty strong radios for what we were doing, but again, there could be situations where you might need a, a stronger signal and, and have information or, or technology that would allow you to have stronger uh, signals for those specific purposes. So sorry if I'm not answering that completely, but we, that's not something we needed or specifically tested. Great, thank you. We have another question from uh, Erdek. Uh, could the system uh, you described be used to collect data from sensors below ground, for example, in groundwater monitoring well? Yeah, I, I believe, you know, again, we, we specifically tested with, with the camera trap, but the system itself is able to um, interact and integrate with a variety of different sensors. So regardless if it's above ground, above ground or below ground, as long as that is a, a sensor that we can interplay and inter, uh, interconnect with the ground station, there's no reason why that information can't be uploaded um, onto, the, onto the UAS. Um, so again, it's, it's more of just making sure there's connectivity between the, the different sensors um, and the cabling and all that kind of thing. But the system is able to take uh, a variety of different sensors and transmit that information to the UAS. So there shouldn't be an issue with that. Um, again, it's just getting an understanding of what those units are, uh, speaking again with the industry partner on this um, and being able to, to work that, that out, but I don't anticipate there being any issues with that. Thank you. This is a question from CEC. Is the Data Mule software available for download? Um, that, 
That would be, I mean, again, it's part of the, I think there is some, um, again, off the check, I'm sorry, off the check with the, um, with the industry partners on that to see if this is free uh, download again, freeware sort of download on this. I know as part of the system um, that down, you know, that data would be uh, downloadable as, as part of, but I believe it is freeware, but again, I'll have to follow up and, and can get back uh, with you on that. So I'm sorry, um, I, I'll need to follow up on that. All right, and, and a similar or follow on question, can the system connect to and download data from multiple sensors at the same time? Yes, I mean, again, we, we did test uh, specifically with, with that for camera traps, but um, as long as there's, um, you know, if you have multiple sensors that are plugging into one communication box, the, the sensor isn't making any determination, you know, any determination on, uh, you know, again, it's, it's being able to collect from multiple sources into the communication box, storing that, and then transmitting that. So there wouldn't be an issue uh, collecting information from multiple sensors. It just need to all be in proximity to wherever you're setting up your communication box, making sure there's uh, connectivity with that box to then transmit the information. So again, there'd have to be determinations on where the communication box is put in the landscape to best connect with those, um, you know, sensors on the ground. Uh, kind of limit the amount of uh, communication boxes that you need so you can get more bang for the buck and, and connect more sensors to that. But there shouldn't be an issue, again, putting multiple sensors in. Um, it's just making that happen and, and figuring out the logistics of, of making that happen. Thank you, David. And this uh, next question is from Mantech. Do space-based communication alternatives exist? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the you. first part of that. Face-based communication alternatives, do they exist? So face-based? Face communication alternatives. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with what that term is. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding what that question is. No worries, we'll just jump to the next question. Um, what restrictions, limitations did you encounter, if any, when conducting your UAS flight? Yeah, so again, one of the things we, um, we were limited with um, is in doing any work on military installations, especially you, you know, we need to do research that isn't gonna impact on the training uh, mission itself. Um, so some of the restrictions or limitations would just be having time to be able to set up to get out into the field. So we were needing to do our work on no-fly weekends when there's no training early mornings before training were, um, would happen, as well as on weekends. Um, so it's an important consideration when doing this and working with the air uh, range management offices on military installations to kind of understand you know, when their activities are and trying to figure out when best you can, we, you can do this. Other kind of restrictions or limitations in flying with UAS, uh, depending on the drone you have as well, is uh, heat and wind. Um, there were temperatures for the drone we were using uh, where we, uh, to safely fly it uh, with very hot conditions, we had to fly when it was under 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and then when the wind was under 15 um, miles per hour. Now, again, there are um, you know, other conditions or, or other pilots that might be able to fly, again, at higher speeds. Um, there might be other airframes that can, can you know, safely uh, fly at, in warmer temperatures. But again, the airframe we were flying was just a, a kind of a vehicle to, to test the system. We weren't really testing the US, UAS as much as we were testing the, um, the data mule and the transfer capability of that. So there could be other uh, uh, UAS that could have more capability, uh, but those were things that um, you know, certainly we need to take into account. Also, you know, choosing an airframe that's going to allow you the, the amount of time in the air um, and, and the mileage that you need to be able to access these sites. Um, you need to take that into account, as I said, trying to understand where you are in the landscape, setting up your, your, um, your landing zones in a way that you can be collecting and, and visiting multiple sites uh, so you don't have to be moving the, the airframe around on the landscape. Thank you, David. And we before we pull in Susan, before we pull her back into the discussion, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked her. Have you quantified the cost savings from uh, using this type of uh, technology or, or can you speak to expected cost savings? 
Yes, yeah, that's one of the things that we um, we're definitely um, addressing as part of this because it's 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 a cost effectiveness issue. So what we wanted to look at is you know how long it takes uh, somebody to go out and visit. So we're looking at the drive time, um, how long it takes to hike to that site. Um, to download that information and then compare it against what we're doing with our drive time, with our flight times, with our loitering times to download the information, uh, putting the airframe together, breaking it down, and those sort of things. Um, so we are, and we're also looking at the uh, return on investment of that. And so through our calculations, um, as I was mentioning before, there is a cost savings um, when you look, especially from if you can fly from sites where you can hit multiple sites at the same time, and you don't have to be taking down and and um, and putting the, the the airframe back together, you can fly from one area. Uh, we we did see a, a forty percent kind of cost savings in that. Um, when it's only one site and you're comparing with a drive time, it's about sixteen, maybe sixteen percent longer and maybe sixteen percent more expensive for the UAS. But if you can have multiple sites, then you can get upwards of a forty percent cost savings. And again. If there's more sites that are, are packed in even closer, the cost savings can be, um, you know, even better. Um, from a, again, return on investment, we are seeing about every um, about two to three years to be get to get return on investment. There's certainly some cost in buying the airframes, um, but again, it's the personnel time that you're saving, uh, the wear and tear on the vehicles, and the safety aspects that are hard to quantify that really. Um, make the difference between those. Um, so again, I think there's a two or three year, uh, as I said, return on investment, there's upwards of 40% or more cost savings um, when it comes to that personnel time that you save. Again, if you can get an airframe that can fly from even longer dis distances, um, then again, your cost savings only increase. Uh, for this test, uh, we again were limited by a 50 minute flight time, um, but again, we were able to demonstrate the successful uh, aspects of this. Uh, if you could put it on a, a larger airframe, um, again, that can fly longer, you can even get more cost benefit. Fantastic. I think Susan also alluded to the, to the um, health and safety considerations, which cannot be quantified, but are critically important. Excellent. Well, at this point, let's invite Susan uh, back to the discussion and I'm gonna pose a question to both of you and we'll start with Susan. Are there plans for deploying the approaches that you both discussed more broadly within the DOD? Susan? Well, that's a great question. We hope so. We've been talking to Marine Corps Installations West about it and I've talked to I've spoken to several different individual installations across services. The Marine Corps was a great place to start for us because the region represents this constrained group and the army so big. So not on a regional level, but on an installation level, we see it at other services and we're working on Marine Corps installations West. Pendleton's a tough nut to crack. Thank you, Susan. David, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I mean, we're certainly in uh, discussions. I've had spoken to to researchers and, and installations about potential interest. Uh, there, there, you know, there hasn't been a, a wide scale use of the technology yet, but you know, I think there is interest. Um, I think it's more of just getting, as we're doing here with the seminar and, and presentations and other things, getting the information out there, uh, having people understand that this is a, a system that can work across different sensors and can work on different UAS. So again, they don't necessarily have to buy a, a new UAS or a new sensor, but they can integrate that into the system. So we're having those conversations. Um, I think there is need uh, for kind of more enterprise scale uh, in getting these, this sort of technology because there are you know, a lot of installations that have limited access to, to sensitive areas training ranges and things as Susan was showing earlier, um, you know, where you don't necessarily want to have somebody trudge out or take a lot of time or safety aspects to that. So if you can do it with a, with a drone and, and save them time and, and money, um, you know, it's, it's beneficial. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I specifically asked you both about cost savings and you brought into the discussion things that can be quantified um, like, um, you know, uh, health and safety. Uh, can you summarize how, if there are any other uses of UAS uh, on military land that help the military in meeting its mission goals? Uh, David, we'll start with you. Did we miss anything that you'd like to communicate to our audience members? 
Um, I think the, the main thing is, is just having a system that has a, kind of is agnostic uh, and being able to work with uh, different research questions. Um, so again, being able to plug in different sensors, being able to use different uh, drone types to, to, to address different questions and to be holistic in it too. So you're not using it just for one sensor, but you can have multiple sensors plugged into the same system to be able to get things not, uh, more robustly as well, especially if you're trying to look at cause and effect be able to collect different sensors at the same time so you have a, a stronger story and you can uh, provide that information to the resource managers so they can be more adaptive in their management decisions. Thank you. Susan, anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, we've had a couple of great examples where we have flown an area prior to a large military exercise and it really allowed the units coming together. There were multiple services coming to one location and it really allowed folks to see a different perspective of where they were entering an exercise, exiting an exercise, were splash points available? Um, were there erosion points currently that needed to be shored up prior to the, the launch of the exercise? So we've seen it as a way to prepare uh, military units for large scale events where they really need a different perspective Perspective on the area that they're going to be occupying and to take proactive actions to make sure that mission is met and the landscape is what they expect it to be. So that's one of the greatest mission uses we've seen so far. Right. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, David, for great presentation, uh, presentations and, and engaging uh, Q&A sessions. At this point, I'd like to remind uh, our audience that the next webinar on June 2nd um, will be in the environmental restoration program area and will focus on DOD funded research efforts to demonstrate geophysical approaches for estimating the rate for efficient governing dual domain mass transfer as well as immobile uh, porosity. This webinar will feature three speakers, uh, one from NASDAQ, XWIC, um, Rutgers University and Pacific Northwest National Lab. Registration is open, so please visit the CERDOP and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars through the beginning of 2023. And before we conclude, as um, Kurt mentioned, uh, we'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. At this time, we'd like to please ask you to take a moment to complete a very quick survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for participation, for participating. <laughs>